Hello, everyone, to another exciting uh, session for today. Uh, considering it's it's a special day for us, Labor Day. For so, first of all, a very happy happy Labor's Day uh, to all my panelists here. Uh, uh, we do have a set of a very enthralling panel, uh, which will be discussing on the topic. You know how do biases in uh, you know how do biases are prevailing in our community already into different realms. It's not specific to one aspect. But, you know, where we would like to lay emphasis is, you know, have layoffs given rise to a stronger employee workforce solidarity. Uh, you know, uh, just to introduce everyone who will be there on the panel, we have uh, Mr. Ragnish from Ericsson. We have uh, Unmesh Sir from Densu and we have uh, Mr. Amit Incholikar from Yokohama. Welcome on board, uh, all the panelists. It's a pleasure for me to be speaking to you all. Likewise. Pleasure is ours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And yep. wishing all those who are listening into this uh, and watching this one right now uh, a happy Labor's Day. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, for people, uh, just to give an introduction, a brief of what exactly we'll be speaking, what all will it consist in our today's conversation. Well, you know, in today's fast-paced and highly competitive business world, companies often face difficult situations of reducing their workforce through layoffs. You know, it is it is something that has been ongoing and it's a very hot topic. Uh, layoffs can have a significant impact on both the employees who are let go and those who remain within the company itself. It is, it is a stigma attached to them that those who are there left in the company, so the onus comes on them and there is a lot more responsibility and expectation that needs to come from them at its their end. You know, while the immediate aftermath of layoffs can be devastating for those who's, uh, you know, who's laid off and their jobs are not in place. Now, some argue that it can also have a positive impact on remaining employees in terms of productivity specifically. You know, this has led to the question of whether layoffs can give rise to a stronger employee workforce solidarity or not. So in today's discussion with Mr. Pawar, Mr. Chancholikar and Mr. Vashish, we'll explore the potential effects of layoffs on productivity, motivation, and the overall job satisfaction of remaining employees and whether these effects can ultimately lead to a stronger and a more resilient workforce or not. My question is uh, open to all. Anybody can take it up. First question, how do you think have layoffs impacted employee morale and job security in respective organizations across sectors? It's got nothing to do with sectors because layoffs have happened across segments. So in your view, what has been the impact of the same on employees' morale? Those who've been laid off and those, you know, who were made to stay within an organization. Anyone can begin. We can begin from me, sir. Well, thank you, Sugand. I think, uh, look, I think it's a very pertinent topic considering where we are right now. <laughs> I think just to backtrack a bit, I think it's also imperative, Sugand, to understand that right sizing and I, I would not use the word layoff but i would use right sizing is a way of life when you're running a business right i think and especially so where organizations have been a bit more ambitious coming out of covid to say what the growth projections would look like and if one were to assume that the growth that one saw the jump to digital that one saw through covid we're going to continue and that's how organizations build their year plan the revenue plans and with revenue plans comes growth plans from a headcount perspective. So a lot of organizations did what they needed to do to be able to get ahead of that and be able to attract the talent to support that. And what happened coming out, whether it's the macros, whether it's what's happening with the Ukraine war and all of that potentially, and what you're starting to see in the Bani world, you're starting to see that the growth projections are not staying true. So if the if the top line or the growth projections are not going to stay through, then your costs need to come in, in, in line under that. And that's what organizations are pretty much doing right now, right? Organizations are trying to tighten the belt and get their cost under control. And what's also happening is consumer sentiment, consumer behavior is changing drastically. That's causing you to shift business models shift operating models and that's what is the other reason why organizations are potentially looking at right sizing now uh, is it good for the organization on one side you need to tighten the belt you need to stay relevant you need to be economically fit and therefore you need to do this but i think it's important to realize that it also has its uh, downsides to some degree right and i say there are downsides because uh, a it causes an element of stress in the system right because it causes insecurity for people both who are 
going to be impacted as also people who are going to stay within the organization it causes unnecessary stress and distraction in the organization first uh second it also means that uh, sometimes if you do not do a good job of communicating with people the reasons why you are doing this transparently the criteria that you use to be able to take these decisions if it's not understood by everybody adequately it also results and if people feel that they haven't been given adequate notice or the change hasn't been adequately managed then the chances that it also depletes trust in the organization third it does impact productivity initial right because people are running helter skelter people are insecure people are trying to figure out and any change brings an element of disruption in the first phase so there is an element of uh, disruption that people will face in the organization because of everything that's happening uh, in this entire thing um relationships suffer right you to in, to a large degree if if i was to be let go off and you and you were to stay in the organization and we've been friends and i just can't fathom saying how how the things happen to me and not to you right sometimes so all of that has an impact on the organization to some degree that does impact employee engagement that does employees in uh, affect employee satisfaction to a decent degree so that's some of the 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 negative impact if you but there are also positives right i mean the organization becomes fitter the organization becomes more agile over a longer period of time uh, you start to play to your strengths you start to play to your core strengths and it also creates opportunities for people who can now take bigger jobs within the organization so right so i think those in my mind pros and cons uh, of both i think uh, when you do when you take right sizing action i'm going to hand this back to the my fellow panelists i'm sure they have uh, perspectives to offer yeah so yes yes uh, i'm are we the two yeah, yeah, one or these, there are no, others no, yeah, yeah you yeah. are the one sir what's your view on the same well uh, see it's you know of course there are there are pros and cons uh, of doing this now since the question pertains to the employee morale uh, so if you look at context lies there are two ways to look at like one is that what's an indian context how does uh lay off is looked at and how does it look from the western side of world particularly say united states mm-hmm. now now india is an is an context we all know it is that in which we have been grown up in a family environment and wherever we go we build relationships and there is a lot of element of trust which is involved when we build our fathom our relationships around the organization which are working on in fact there are there are certain people uh, more so from the vintage i come from is that they made over the years they made relationships in the organization they are built in because they are so obsessed with the work and stuff and it's not only i there are hundreds and thousands of such people are working in so um see uh you know if let's say there are employees which are which are uh, asked to leave and laid off uh it's not only because of the productivity or the financial reasons uh, or the organizations has taken a uh, taken a choice to weed out people who are not performing but there are i have seen there are people who are doing in the organization they have potential they have reposed trust they have been going stretching out of the way to do the things and suddenly one day with all the better communications which are done uh they are at the uh at the door step of being asked to leave in the organization exactly. while you know i do too. agree like hmm. uh, while i do yeah yeah it's very uncertain and there is a substantial chunk and i'm not saying these are the only people there are there is a substantial chunk of people who have a potential and then in the context of india where there is so much of stigma involved with people who have been laid off uh when people are you know though we have been able to achieve those short term efficiencies in the system uh you know look at like this you know if the, it's it's an let's say organization is looked from a prism of uh, of a life or an living organism it leaves the people may leave everybody forgets because the churning is so much in the organization you know after 2 3 years if i look around go go in the organization i don't see such people and there are new faces which are there but it leaves with you know some inherent dormant lack of trust in the system is that you know the tomorrow nobody is secured here in this job right 
so however good you performer you are and you know that dormant lack of trust is have a cost which organization is paying in a longer run mm. uh, while you know there are two sides of looking at it on one side is that you know my job and everybody's job is now secured as long as i'm performing well something wrong can go wrong everybody is on the toes and they are working harder and harder to outdo each other but then at the same time everybody at the other side is looking around and seeing is that i have to find a job i have to have three jobs secured you no know, he's always there on the lookout now this let's say if i look from an organization let's say people prism on one side we have been expecting employees to be wanting to stay in the organization and loyalty and st- such kind of things we have been debating on on when there is a high attrition other side such mistrust and uh, are actually leaving and such right. these are the two extremes in which we are living in and there is no right answer uh, mm-hmm. to this um, but i i think you know it has an on a shorter run a huge damaging effect on the morale of people no it does i would i would agree to it considering even if i'm thinking from an employer stand of point or from an employees it does affect because even with people who are made to stay back and you know they see the kind of layoffs that have happened in front of them i i told in the beginning also it just give them sudden jerks and a sudden amount of expectation rises from the one who are left amit sir do you have something to add to it so i think uh, really great points and uh, you know the on- the only thing that i would uh, uh, really add is it's it's really important to understand the context of why do layoffs take place right and mm-hmm. i think uh, i think uh, both uh, uh, unmesh and uh, rajneesh i think called that out uh, really well i think a simple fact remains that if companies were over um, enthusiastic and uh, you know went overboard in terms of hiring large numbers you know post covid because this what happened is in certain functions it's not it may not have been large amount of hiring but the kind of increases that uh, you know that people got when they jumped you know to the tune of 50% and 100% so what happened is people simply got outpriced as far as markets were concerned that's point number right. one point number two you'll find that a large amount of hiring of this nature that happened predominantly happened in services technology and consulting type environments right wherein the expectation was that there would be significant amount of investment and significant amount of you know this that would happen if you predominantly look at large manufacturing oriented or you know uh, uh, you know consumer <clears throat> oriented businesses you would have find you would have found that uh, you know um, hiring of this nature actually happened only in certain pockets so what happened is now when companies are required to pull back it's primarily on three counts one is indiscriminate hiring so you know we said let's just hire and uh, you know figure out uh, what happens next second is you know uh, the kind of increases that uh, people demanded and got were simply disproportionate and mm-hmm. the third is therefore and the third actually is on account of performance now each of these three reasons one could argue you know have an employer uh, you know um, uh, you know side to it and an employee side to it but the short answer is does it generate uh, 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 you know uncertainty and distrust 100% in the short term it always does because people don't know uh, why is it that this has suddenly kind of come right especially when you do mass numbers people don't understand that the other i think uh, challenge is that when people see that overall there is a need to reduce cost right then people will still understand it that you know it's happening on all counts and not just on the employee count but for example and this is a fairly well publicized example right microsoft uh, you know one day before they laid out 10000 people had a concert that was done by sting in right. uh, for its uh, for their top executives in devos right and the next day uh, you know the ceo comes on and says you know listen we are going to let 10000 people go so sometimes what happens is the perception of uh, what is mine is mine and what is yours is negotiable is what makes it the hardest right that's point number one i think the point number two and i think rajneesh alluded to this as well i think we are now entering an age where hopefully layoffs of this nature aren't seen with that degree of stigma any longer because the numbers are so large right if mm. a few people are laid off you know then you can say attributed to performance or you know right say but when you have uh, you know collectively something like you know between ed tech and uh, financial services and stuff like that since january to now i think i estimate about you know 25 30000 people have been laid off 
Hmm. Then you understand that there is a serious issue that's happening. So I think the good thing is people understand that layoffs are not entirely employee issues. Point number exactly. one. Exactly. I think so it's got it's got to do a lot with the performance metrics as well and right sizing, as Unmesh sir pointed out. And I think what's also happening is the pressure effectively that organizations face are from investors, and you have to stand in front of investors every ninety days, right? So it's a very short term view that you kind of end up taking on this. So it's a bit tricky. It's not easy for anyone. but i think the answer is does it drive a degree of mistrust the answer is yes the downside therefore you face is relationships you know and rajneesh alluded to this uh, you know so nicely relationships that otherwise you may have cultivated in a long uh, you know over a long period of time eventually become transactional right and that's mm. the that you know i always say that you know with with choices you make there are consequences and the choices may be yours and the consequences never are so when we made a choice of doing what we did the consequences are something we have to live with so uh, you know as this as the song by the famous uh, uh, you know rock band metallica goes uh, it's sad but true <laughs> no indeed it's, it's the hard reality but you know very rightly quoted people are getting used to it now earlier when the layoffs began to happen it wasn't a phenomena that you know employees were used to but today they're more vigilant of the kind of work and the output that they produce because at the back of their head then there's this always this connotation that hangs that you know we may be laid off on performance metrics but uh you know uh, see uh, see the consequence of this which i said is that you know everybody is protecting their own interest while exactly. on one side an employer is protecting their interest by these mass layoffs because of indiscriminate or let's say let's use not so right word of mindless hiring and employees are also protecting their own interest so they are also getting used and geared up to what's going to happen next so you know i see another trend of let's say let me amass as much salary as i can in the shorter period of time and you know that's why there are people who are changing very fast very fast very fast so that you know i can increase and maximize my salary in a shorter period of time now mm -hmm. the consequent thing is that you know for any change to be brought in usually it takes longer horizon of people to work in organizations so people don't work because there is a mistrust and you know these these are the consequence of you know taking such short term you know or some let's say lopsided decisions to be taken on the long run these are actually making a newer realities in the system we eventually will adapt like western world has adapted to it but on the on the path there is a heavy price needs to be paid for that completely agree sir and of course the people who hearing also and our fellow panelists they'll also agree with this point of view uh on me sir how in your view can unions you know and other employee advocacy groups help promote solidarity and support among workers in face of layoffs because as as from belonging from a labor community i i feel that you know people when they're laid off sudden layoffs specific to sudden layoffs they straight away run to these unions considering they always have their backs but unions also have a role to play in your view how can they actually mold this situation in a more positive way and help them help these workers you know face layoffs in a, in a positive impact sure subhan i think i'm just going to take the conversation forward from when rajneesh left it and connect this to what we are saying here right i think rajneesh made some very very pertinent points i think i think few things that i see this happening right i think what covid did to some degree and when things went went really hard and bad for people everybody became individualistic to some degree right everybody started to worry about themselves they started to worry about their family first and through the process somewhere the contract between the employer and employee while from an employer standpoint we did everything to extend it to family etc etc but somewhere at the core of the at the core of it the contract shifted slightly to say at the end i got to take care of myself and my family right. and that is what you saw coming back post covid this whole drama about hybrid and then i do not want to come back to work and this whole great resignation where because of covid people were really stretched hard because they were insecure so people were putting in more hours and productivity suddenly jumped drastically and people were on that on that um, on that 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 stretch for a long time and people exactly. somewhere then said you know what we are not going to be sacrificing as much now 
it's not going to happen. And therefore, you saw whether you call it the great resignation or you call it the quiet quitting and all of that you experienced because people were just tired of giving so much to it. And I think therefore, if I were to connect this to our labor question, I think but the big thing that needs to happen in this entire thing is really about uh, this conversation between resignation vis-a-vis right sizing. And I think uh, I think it's so well said, Rajneesh said, right, that when it comes to when resignations happen, the great resignation happened, the organization and leadership and HR and everybody was crying foul to say, this is not fair. How can people do this? And how can people right. en masse even hoards like this? But at the same time, when organizations have to tighten the belt for whatever reasons, right, whether it is thought through or they were stupid decisions that organizations ended up taking and they have to right size, then the employer, employee doesn't have much agency. So that power balance somewhere is that friction is playing out. And I think therefore it's imperative in my mind that organizations do a better job of scenario planning. I think you need to have continuous scenario planning to build out saying what are optimistic plans, what are pessimistic plans and what will allow you, what lead and lag indicators will allow you to move on that. And, and going back to what Amit said, right? All headcount right sizing needs to be potentially one of the last actions you take and not the first actions you take. Exactly. Sadly, most organizations feel that's the easiest thing to do but it has long lasting impact on the organization. Therefore, L1, L2, L3 actions about austerity measures, cutting down on all the paraphernalia, our leaders putting in more cuts on the table, right? Of all the fly travel that is happening, can we prune travel? So all of those are things that you need to first do before you come on to say you need to do headcount right sizing. Uh, skill building, I think is important. And I connect that to our labor question. So if organizations have not continuously invested in thinking about the future of work and what skills will need as the business environment is shifting, then you will be at a point in time where you realize that the people you have and all the people you need going forward, because there is a capability gap. So what can unions do in this entire thing? I think, look, I don't have much experience of the unions, but I can relate to advocacy groups, right? I think, um, uh, one is I think these advocacy advocacy groups need to be seen as genuinely being neutral and not playing favorites one way or the other, right? And in, in, in today's time, it's rather difficult for them to stay on the middle line. So that's first to be, are, are our employees seeing a fair treatment? I think that's going to be important to do. They need to, over a period of time and now and in the future, mandate from the management a good skill and a reskilling program that is a continuous learning program that is ensuring that you are building skills for the people, ensuring that the workers' rights are protected, right? And whatever right. is the law at that point in time, when you, when there is a handshake that needs to happen, ensure that what severance or whatever needs to be provided to people uh, is being done in the right manner. And more than just the, the severance, I think it's about health benefits that you're going to allow hmm. them allow people to have is going to be important uh collected collective actions if required and whether it is stopping work or etc whatever that needs to be done but done in a more in a manner which is efficient rather than destructive to society in my mind and finally i think it's creating a sense of community because when people are let go off that's the only thing that they have and that there's a sense of loss of identity. There's a social stigma associated with impact of all of that. But figuring out a way to build a community of these people so that they find support, help groups, I think are, are some thoughts that I have on what advocacy groups and organizations can do in, in times like well, these. Very where well said points. Actually, this is something that needs to be incorporated and not just uh, be more of a vocal conversation. Uh, you know, it's coming from corporates, but then unions also need to advocate all these policies in the way they, you know, protect these workers. Rajni, sir, your words, your your views on it as to how can or what could be the role of, uh, you know, unions uh, in such a circumstance wherein employees just run back to them for help. Well, you know, like in India, I didn't have an experience much with work, let's say with unions. My my vision is clouded with a lot of horrible stories we hear outside. Uh, so it, it may be a little biased view, but I, I did get an opportunity now in the recent past to work with how it happens in Europe. And, you know, what I found that in Europe, though being such developed nations in comparison, let's say to India, uh, there has been a reasonable, I'll not say totally, but a reasonable trustworthy relationship and engagement relationship in which two sides talk and negotiate what are going to be the benefits and what are the reasons for which people are being 
let go. Now, uh, there, there must have been some historical reasons that there, is, there has been a huge trust deficit from my biased prism uh, between employees and unions in India. Um, there must be there must be a ray of hope in which the two parties can sit together. Uh, see, I mean, it would be foolhardy to think that um, as long as you know employees or management is benevolent, they may be able to do certain things better for their employees. And there are some organizations in, in which management has been pretty benevolent, uh, but at the same time, there is a space for the for the pressure groups on the other side employees who are let's right. say perceived as as not as stronger in the negotiation terms but to have some meaningful conversations in which the employees uh, relationships uh, can be uh, interests can be protected uh, while i would let go let's say you know what kind of unions and you know advocacy groups can do but i think there is a case for people function like from which uh, you know, all of us come from, is that, uh, you know, uh, th there is a case for 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 the people function also to also be a little more pressing the pedal in which, you know, making out a case of better, let's say, uh, packages or health benefits or the separation benefits for an employees, which I believe are far short of uh, what it requires for employee to find a job within. But now this is a very sensitive group, uh, a change, and I see a very little ha effort happening. And because of the organizational dynamics and how power equations are, and this concept of people business partner, as soon as this business cap is coming on the people function, and I, I have I've started having my doubts that, you know, what which part are we advocating? for uh, is that you know then who is negotiating for that employee's behalf uh, but if in case if we are able to wear that people hat or employee hat little bigger i think there are organizations most of the organizations have a capacity to do more than what they do as per the last states uh, at the same time there are there is a possibility for them to spend that money as well so i mean that's where i think you know uh, you know if, if we are the one who's in in the mediation between the two groups i think we'll have to look at you know who is at the more losing end you know how can we make this that separation exactly. better that's, than that's a very sane decision to do in situations like this um it's our last few minutes we want your views on the same as to what is what is your view what do you think can employers do and can these advocacy groups do to bridge the gap between them so I think, uh, uh, you know, I would say a view that, I mean, it could be slightly counter to what we maybe we've heard so far from Rajneesh and Umesh both. And the reason why I say that is that particularly if you look at, uh, I mean, and, and we can treat, let's say, I would say unions and advocacy groups slightly separately because they, mm. uh, I think, cater to different employee segments. Now, what happens is with unions over a period of time, I think, the concept of no surprises is something that uh, uh, <clears throat> that I think most most organizations have got in place. And the reason why I say that is the only reason why there are two reasons why Tata, right? Mm -hmm. One is either you're replacing it with technology, and that is not something that happens overnight. So we always, you know, there is always work that happens around reskilling. Let people know that you know, listen, what we were doing with. Uh, you know, 1,000 people will probably need to do with 500 people now, et cetera, et cetera. And that is not uncommon across, uh, uh, you know, various employ uh, various employers across India as well. I mean, even, even I mean, I would imagine that, uh, you know, let's say one of the most benevolent or the most employee-centric uh, employees in India would be the Tatars, for example, right? Mm. Even there, you found significant amount of, <clears throat> layoffs, I wouldn't say layoffs, but you know, uh, people have let go with changes in technology in places like Tata Steel, Tata Motors, etc. Substantive numbers. Now the, re now, the reason why it works is A, people understand why it's happening. B, you mm. do it with some degree of dignity and respect. And C, you ensure that you take care of personal situations specifically. So, like for example, if someone's child is going through a crucial year, which is standard 10 or standard 12, I, for example, right? Mm. Or you have, a, you have a daughter or a son who has to get married in the next few years. You take care of those personal situations so that people understand that when a situation of this nature comes up, 
the employer is understanding of your situation while a decision needs to be taken. So exactly. I think it is it can be managed well if it's communicated well, right? That is the, so that that's and when the case well happens. And planned well as well if you inform in in absolutely, trial. absolutely, absolutely. Now what happens when you when so that happens typically when there is change of technology. Now otherwise, when you were to look at productivity metrics, I think there have been multiple examples where. Companies have moved out of specific states simply because employers, or you know, I, I mean, uh, you know, the specific workers demanded wages that were significantly higher in certain states compared to other states, and in which case the employers have clearly called out going and doing this in another state. Hmm. So, again, while people have held their ground and all of that, etc., etc., you've seen those movements happen more in certain states than other states. Uh, when that is happening, so I think that is uh, there is a fair degree of understanding at that level that if you have to focus on productivity metrics and you have to make sure, uh, you know, it, it is a little bit more rational in terms of headcount numbers, etc. So people right. get the logic. Where it bec- where it becomes a little uh, tricky is because when you've got external involvement, then you know, let's say political affiliation. And that is and that is actually rational, a place. Yes, that is a place that then is then rational to gets thrown out of the window, right? Then, I'm not discussing rash. So I'd like to cut you here because we have last few seconds left now, as we have to manage uh, the flow. Thank you so, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me for joining in this very enthralling discussion. It was a pleasure speaking with you all and knowing your views. 